Award-winning trainers like Bob Baffert and elite thoroughbred owner clients like Ahmed Zayat and Canadian diamond magnate Charles Fipke, among others, have long been sending their young, raw, and filled with potential two-year-old thoroughbreds to the McCathen brothers. Exactly 20 years ago, the McCathen brothers purchased, prepped, and trained 1997 Kentucky Derby and Preakness winner Silver Charm as a two-year-old. A year later, they prepped and trained the subsequent Kentucky Derby and Preakness winner, Real Quiet. On early foggy winter mornings, the first steps in training a racehorse take place across McCathen Brothers Training Center. That's really the, our core philosophy. If it's, you know, like put the horse first and, and, and you know, do what's right for them and, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll develop to their top potential. Talented, yet inexperienced two-year-old thoroughbreds get accustomed to being handled, as well as to the weight of a saddle and the feel of a bit in their mouth. Our job uh, is really, you know, we don't have to teach horses a lot because they, they innately know how to do um, most of the things that we want them to do. It's a process, one which requires learning, intuition, and patience for both the trainer and horse. This is just to get him used to the whip and a lot of movement. Ho. Oh. You gotta have trust in your handlers first. Whoa. You don't, you don't see very many of my horses very nervous. So it's for nerves. On all sports, it's how nervous you are. Back, 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 whoa. The main thing is spontaneous reaction, when to pull, when to stop, when to pet, how to read a horse quickly, because it's over and over, exactly the same thing, over and over. So he knows when he stops, all he gets is petted. That's why he stops, that's why he won't move, because he knows all, all he gets is scratching, you know, petting. When he says, whoa, whoa. Back, back. Whoa, come up. Oh, there, see now, that's spontaneous reaction. When I said come up, he went on three legs and I, I quit right then. Yeah, watch this one now. This is, this is when I got him hypnotized now. Each horse, similar to humans, has his or her own personality, motivations, and anxieties. Behaviors and mannerisms are studied and noted, and often relayed back to the owner clients. By the time they hand them over to us, they're completely trusting of us, and you know we respond and talk to them as the development of their horses come along and um, try to get the best horse we can get for them. Once these young thoroughbreds adjust to having a person on their back and learn to take direction and cues, they progress toward the training track. Strides, gates, and athletic movements are measured and compared, often using technological innovations, sensors, and GPS-like tracking systems. Thoroughbreds are tested for fitness, soundness, and speed. Atop a viewing stand, the McCathen brothers appraise each horse closely. Any advantage, real or perceived, is worth exploring. The top horses exemplify not just speed, but a keen look and a professional attitude. I think identifying that talent and kind of, uh, you know, just really coddling it is, is very important. With these young horses, the, um, just the repetition of having a daily training routine. We've got the little practice gates that they go through every day. Well, they're used to that. Some days we'll have like a group of seven or eight horses just in a big bunch going around together because they have to learn to do that. You know, they don't have to learn to do that. They know how to do that. But they have to feel comfortable with a rider on their back on a racetrack environment. Herd dynamics can prove very revealing. 
often being a key indicator in forecasting future results. Before the start of every race, the assistant starters will close the front doors, which are really heavy, and they're spring-loaded, held together by this electrically charged magnet. Now the horse and jockey are loaded, and the official starter is ready to not turn on the electricity, but to turn it off, allowing the lever to drop and the gates to open. Sound simple? Well, if everything goes smoothly, it is. But that's not always the case. As a jockey, I felt the starting gate was one of the most dangerous aspects of racing. Why is it so dangerous? Well, for one thing, you're surrounded by steel. Now, this gate might look open and airy. Most horses, who can be a bit claustrophobic anyway, feel the crampness of these close quarters. When we enter the gate, the horses usually appear to be very calm on the outside. But on the inside, well, their charged up engine is ready to explode. The jockey must see that his horse is standing four square when the gate flies open. And must be ready as it gathers itself, dropping down on its haunches to make the first lunge onto the track. As with a human athlete, a horse will run the first quarter mile anaerobically, consuming fuel that does not require oxygen from the bloodstream. But from then on, the horse depends on lungs and heart to supply oxygen to the muscles. Through his hands, the jockey must control his mount to as even a pace as the tactics of the race allow. As Secretariat overtakes his stablemate Riva Ridge to win the Marlborough Cup, slow motion film shows how his gait approaches the ideal where each leg, in turn, provides motive power. The spokes of a wheel, as near a continuous flow of thrust as four legs can contrive. However near to genetic limits the thoroughbred has come, there are still horses born that we can only wonder at. Uh, normally jockeys, we rose at between 5.30 and 6 o'clock in the morning and headed out to the racetrack for our morning workouts. And morning workouts really are comprised of visiting barns that you would ride for trainers in the future, maybe that day. You'd be visiting the mounts, the horses if, that you're going to ride in the next day, two, maybe in the next week or two. The, the training hours are typically from 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning until about 10 a.m. in the morning. By 11 o'clock in the morning, I would make my way back to the track, track itself and head to the jockey's room. The very first thing that I do when I hit the jockey's quarters is weigh myself. Come on in, we'll do this. Uh, if, it was a, if it was a fruitful night with food the night before, uh, a lot of liquids, it could be pretty tight and I'm expecting bad news when I step on that scale. So this would be either put a smile on my face or a frown on my face. Thank you. Nobody in the jockey's room during racing hours except the jockeys and their employees. My day was pretty much go in here and get in the, get in the shower, shower off, go in the steam room for about 25 to 30 minutes. I would, I would do a little calisthenics, I would stretch, I would shave, 
I would just loosen up, basically, if you will, and I would lose a pound, a pound and a half in there doing that. This is the masseur's room. An another uh, pretty good place for a jockey to cool down, regroup. I might come in here and lay down with a towel over me for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I told you I might take a, a little brief nap. It would probably happen here. So this was my corner when I was riding. I call it my corner. I shared it with several other jockeys. And uh, the equipment, the actual saddles, are, are located down below. And, and I'll pull out one saddle here. This is a particularly big saddle. Uh, let me get a smaller saddle. This saddle would weigh about, oh, probably about three and a half or four pounds. This saddle would weigh about a pound and a half. You can see the difference. And you would use this saddle on horses that are weighted with higher weights, unless you're very heavy that day. And this saddle would obviously be used for horses with lesser weights. But before the silks go on for each particular race, we'll put on our, our safety vest. It's called a flak jacket, if you will. Uh, it's to minimize uh, injuries if, if and when we fall. And it's not a question of if you're going to fall, it's when in, in, uh, in this business. It's the only business I know that the ambulance follows you. So yeah, it's a risky business. Uh, and that's kind of the, the bad side of it. You've seen the, the weight losing, early mornings, possibility of injury. But there's a lot of good side, too. When riding the Kentucky Derby as a jockey, several items of equipment are required. Among them, a helmet for safety and goggles for vision. And because we run on dirt in the Kentucky Derby, you get dirty. And that requires goggles. Now, going a mile and a quarter, it requires more than one pair. I've used as many as six pairs. In 1993 and 1996, that's exactly how many pairs of goggles I used riding Grindstone and Sea Hero. Now, this is a beautiful sunny day. But kid you not, we still need multiple pairs because they put the water on the track themselves, creating a lot better traction for the horses as they go over it. But six pair of goggles? Try putting six pair of sunglasses on top of each other and looking through them. Things get a little fuzzy, a little blurry. It distorts your vision somewhat, especially peripherally. You can see very little from side to side. As we go through the running of the race and are in amongst the pack, the dirt comes back flying, covers the top pair of our goggles. So we must reach up while we're riding with two fingers and pull a pair of goggles down. We repeat that as we go through the track one by one, hoping not to cover my mouth. That has happened before, and that's a heck of a problem getting my air. I'm here to win a race, and I have to make multiple decisions and try and coax the best run out of my horse that I can. But I need to see very clearly. And through all this, I have to reach up unconsciously and pull them down. And I hope that I've judged the amount of goggles I've carried with the amount of distance I've traveled and not run out before I hit the finish line. It's happened to me before, and it's not fun. To me, there's nothing more exciting than riding horse races for a living. But with that excitement comes an element of danger. How dangerous? Well, how many jobs do you know where an ambulance actually follows you? For every race run here at Pimlico today, the ambulance will follow the field of horses as they travel around the track. Even the ride to the track is not without risk. Horses can spook at almost anything, throwing their rider at any moment. And along with all the physical demands, the jockey must survive the mental challenge of the spill. Jockeys must accept the fact that it's not if they will fall, but when. Yes, bones will be broken, but you just have to pray it's not career ending. Sweetwater Oak on the outside of Current Lady Head and Head. Sweetwater Oak loses the rider. Current Lady in front. Almost always, spills happen without warning. Fortunately for jockey Julian Lepreau, he landed on a safety rail, which has a hard plastic shield on top of it, allowing a jockey to bounce clear rather than being wrapped around one of its supporting poles. Lepreau was lucky and walked away from this, but not all jockeys do. Unlike NASCAR drivers who are surrounded by a steel cage to protect them during a crash, a jockey's only safety equipment are their helmet and their protective cage, the vest. For a jockey, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. We're all going to get hurt at some point. It's how bad you're going to get hurt. A little bit crazy. You have a 1,200-pound horse. A bit brave and you weigh 110 pounds. <laughs> and a bit courageous at the same time. It really doesn't bother me that I've broken my neck three times. Oh, I crushed my skull at church and I was. I have a plate and five screws holding my collarbone together. Broken pelvis. Broken ribs. Collapsed lungs. Four, five pins put in my hand. 
My head looked like a spider web. I fractured it so bad. Took out my spleen. Broken my kneecap. I broke in my fingers. Unfortunately, it's part of the game. And because it's part of the game, we have to make sure that we're thoroughly protected when we're out there. But uh, there's only so much you can do, you know, besides putting row bars on horses or something, you know. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you have a helmet, you have a flak jacket now, and your boots, and that's pretty much it. When I'm scared out there, my saddle's going on the wall. I don't have time for that. The day I'm going to start thinking about it, that's the day I'm going to retire. To get back on a horse, to me, is what I love to do. I go out there, do what I have to do, and that's my job. Because I love to do it, you know what I mean? It, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't scare me one bit. Uh, I don't look at the severe, the consequences of, of being that uh, it might uh, shorten my career. It, it all comes down to what you want to do in life. Joe whips like baseball bats, come in a variety of lengths and weights, and are manufactured according to specific regulations. There are whips for every taste or need. Some whips are heavy and firm, others light, and they bend like fishing poles. Often, a rider chooses a certain type of whip to fit a particular horse. For example, a sturdy version for a large, powerful beast, and a lighter one for a dainty filly. And then, there's the superstition factor. If a jock has had success in big races with a certain whip, you can be sure that's the one he'll choose when the big money is down. And I made a promise to myself. I thought if God ever gave me a talent, mm. that I would never waste a day or an hour developing it to its fullest. And I made that pledge to myself, and it's kind of carried me through life. You have gotten a full day's work, both figuratively and literally, in this sport. I mean, up at 3.30 in the morning and out at that track. What fires you up about early morning at the racetrack? We have some beautiful footage of what it's like in that morning. I, I think that it's probably the, the most beautiful time of the day. It's, it's you one-on-one. -on -one. You see the product that you're working with. You, it's a master plan that you're bringing them to a derby or a Preakness or a Breeders' Cup. And uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a great serenity. It's in a setting like Santa Anita or Belmont Park, you just can't beat it. Uh, I ride a nice saddle horse, I get out there, my mind clears from all the clutter of everything else and the business side of this thing that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And I just like the one-on-one -on -one relationship with just me and a good horse. It, it's, it's amazing and it sounds almost comical that you relate well to horses, but there are people who suggest that the deep, dark secret of Wayne Lucas is that horses understand Wayne and Wayne understands the horse. You think it's true? I tell my assistants that they should constantly think like the horse. That one of the keys to training is to put yourself in the horse's position. And one of my favorite statements is that the horse is always right, no matter what the situation, the horse is right. Make me an attorney for the horse and I'll never lose a case. <laughs> and by that I mean no matter what he does on the racetrack or how he messes up, if he fights the gate, he bears out on the turn, that there's a reason behind that and that the horse is always right. And uh, I think you got to think like them in order to train them, and you got to have that feel. And if you don't, I think you're missing the, the boat. And another thing is, I, I think that a lot of trainers dwell on the physical side of getting him fit, heart rate, aerobic, mm -hmm. heartbeat, uh, lung capacity, and so forth, and neglect the mental side. The I think spirit. a horse has to, has to have that spirit, has to have that try, and that's mm -hmm. true of any athlete. I want to talk about your spirit. If it's not too personal for a few moments, in this Bill Knack article in Sports Illustrated, it said that you were obsessed to a point where when you sit down for dinner, it's, let me have a Coke and a menu, and in 10 minutes, you're up and out, that you told your wife, uh, honey, I'd like to take a nap right now. Wake me up in seven minutes. Right. I mean, you don't like to waste time. I mean, time <laughs> is really precious for you. Well, I, I, think that, I think that what happens to us is that we, we get our... Uh, our lift, we get our cherishing of the day through different things. Sure. I get it through an intensity of going out and trying to accomplish things. I keep score in everything I do. Uh, and so what I do is I want to eat and get on to the next task, and that's my way of really getting what maybe some people get out of a golf game. How much is money still the motivator for you? 
it's a way of keeping score. I don't think the material things are as important. I, if, if somebody were to ask me right now what my net worth is, I could, I could not tell you. I know it's a lot better than it was a few years ago, but uh, it's just a way of keeping score for me. I, I, I enjoy some very nice material things, but the, the thing that I like is the sense of competition. I like to take on Lasborough and Charlie Whittingham, uh, Woody Stevens, and uh, you know, it's a funny thing, we'll win a race. And it, we won't even get the horse cooled out and back to the barn. I'm thinking, where can I run him again, and where mm -hmm. can we take him on the next time? I, I thrive on it. Had a chance to really explore and find out a little bit about why he feels the way he does, but he also has a philosophy that embodies in what he calls the trainer's dozen. It's a list of 12 qualities of life to live by. It includes things like the value of time, the success of perseverance, the pleasure of working. But down in the list, there's one that really knocked me out, and I think it's true. The power of kindness. In the final moments here, can you capsulize that power? Well, that's a, I made up that list and, and talked about that, and I added that because I think that nobody gets anywhere. Uh, Roy Firestone didn't get his awards and get where he is in life. Wayne Lucas didn't get where he is in life, or Michael Jordan, or Larry Bird, or any of us. Get where we are at, at the pinnacle of our careers without a lot of help along the way. And I know nothing that feeds that as much as kindness. With four and a half furlongs remaining, it's Song and a Prayer, and he leads by two lengths over Balto Star. Millennium Wind is now third toward the inside. Congaree in good striking position on the outside, and the pent-up power of Point Given. Five lengths from the lead, he's beginning to advance. Express Tour is right with him as the field rounds the far turn. Then Invisible Ink, Thunder Blitz as well within striking range. Jorge Chavez gets busy on Monarcos, and they're surging as they move toward the top of the stretch. And Congaree has come away with the lead. Here comes his stablemate point given on the outside. They're in three quarters in 109 and one. Record time here in the Derby are at the top of the stretch. And it is Congaree who is full out. Here comes Monarcos under a heavy drive on the far outside. Invisible Ink is there. Point given, not today. One furlong left. Here comes Monarcos who sweeps to the lead. He's pulling away by two. He's pulling away by three. Jorge Chavez and Monarcos have won the Kentucky Derby. Now, let's ride with Jorge Chavez and Monarcos the entire way in the Kentucky Derby. Sort of breaking a little sideways, not uncommon, and uh, no real problems. Number 16 in the gold and blue colors of the Oxleys. And getting away cleanly as Chavez places the stretch running Colt in the proper position. About midway down the back stretch, where Monarcos made that giant move to win the Florida Derby, is where Chavez starts to pump and changes his goggles right there, gets his whip out, and now he is beginning to ride in earnest. Gives Monarcos a little tap to wake him up. And look at him accelerate as he moves inside two horses, inside again on the rail, the ground-saving trip from Chavez. And he has Monarcos in full gear right here. Monarcos picking up horses right and left. He goes by Keats, who's fading. And next he has dead aim on number four, Thunder Blitz. And in front of him, Balto Star, as the speed horses are dropping back. And Monarcos gets a tap again from Chavez, who puts him on the outside, out in the middle of the track to keep him out of trouble. Here's Point Given looming now just to his inside. Chavez comes over right there, is where the objection occurred. But you can see that Invisible Ink really was not impeded as Monarcos was clear as he went by. Chavez having switched the whip to his left hand, now drives to the finish line. They call him Chop Chop because of his whip work. He doesn't need it here, though. Monarcos home free in the Derby. Woo, baby! <laughs>